As of late, nothing interests me more than obscure musicals that nobody knows about. It was a rabbit hole. I watched the Nemo musical and ended up falling deeper and deeper until I found out about the Doug musical and realized that maybe I should look within. But in this deep dive that's been going on for the past few months that has definitely annoyed the hell out of my friends, I struck gold a few times. I found the Creature from the Black Lagoon musical, which is, in my opinion, maybe the best worst musical ever to grace the stage. And with that, I discovered Spider-Man Rocks, a very bizarre show that resided in the same theater that Creature would a few years later. But this got me thinking, what other Spider-Man musicals are out there? I mean, everyone knows about U2's disaster piece, Turn Off the Dark, and I've been cursed with the knowledge of Spider-Man Rocks, but are there any else out there? Well, my friends, I'm thrilled to tell you that there is at least one more, and I can almost assure you that you've never heard of it. So join me on this journey. Let us talk about Spider-Man's three official musical endeavors. These are all canon. No one can prove me wrong. This is very important to me. Part one, Spider-Man Rocks. Spider-Man Rocks is the most uncomfortable musical on this list, so I feel it's best to just rip the band-aid off. It replaced a musical at Universal Studios Hollywood called Beetlejuice's Rock and Roll Graveyard Review, and it opened in 2002. This is usually where I would tell you who wrote the music for this thing, but Spider-Man Rocks is actually a jukebox musical, which means there are a myriad of composers. I'll just cover them as we go. One last thing before we get into it, this musical opened the same month as Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, which means it spent its entire run in the shadow of Tobey Maguire showing the world just how cool Spider-Man could be. And that's just so unfortunate. Anywho, let's just swing into it. <sighs> I do it because you hate it. So, Spider-Man Rocks begins with crime, as any good Spider-Man cold open would. <laughs> This is the weirdest intro to any musical I've ever seen, and I'm not really sure what they're going for here. It's mostly just a bunch of people dancing on the streets of Queens. It's awesome. Anyway, when I saw that there was a mugging in the first scene of this musical, I, as I assumed that everybody else did, figured that Spider-Man would come in and stop it. This is not the case, and we are actually transported to Midtown High because Spider-Man Rocks is an origin story. <sighs> Why? <laughs> I'm sorry, but I know it's not just me who's getting tired of seeing the same story told over and over again every time there's a reboot of Spider-Man. Spider-Man has, like, the most famous origin story. Why must we see it every time? Especially when your musical is less than 20 minutes long. The reason they did this is kind of obvious to me. If you wanted to throw a Spider-Man musical into your theme park, what's the easiest possible solution? You reuse the origin story that everybody knows and is guaranteed to get you a positive reaction from your audience. And instead of writing an original score, you use pop hits that everyone can clap along to. It seems smart on Universal's end, but it's also hacky, lazy, and just downright boring. New York, a city with a million stories. And who am I? Just one of those stories. Oh boy, a voiceover. But let me start at the beginning. There was this girl. A horny voiceover. I love the sound effect that they play for MJ when she appears on stage. I wish they did that whenever I entered a room. This is already the corniest thing I've ever seen. Every piece of dialogue feels like it was written by a robot. That's me, Peter Parker. Very funny. Peter turns into Spider-Man, and we get our first song, but not before Peter writhes on stage during some haunting operatic vocals. The first song is the unfortunately predictable Holding Out for a Hero, which is a song that I like, uh, but not here. It's incredibly dramatic, and often interrupted by those ominous vocals that I mentioned. Well, It's bizarre, and I kind of love it. It does not fit together at all. Peter gets shirtless and starts climbing shit, and pretty soon we have our Spider-Man. Wow! None of this looks safe. I'm always just a little nervous with theme park stunts. Some of them, of course, are done very well, but then you have Tarzan Rocks, where people got pretty seriously injured. And not to shame Universal, 
but they're definitely not working with the same budget that Disney is, so this is a little worrisome. Anyway, most of that number is just Peter monkeying around shirtless. <laughs> Is this show? Why is this scene so silent? Someone please say something. Talk to me, tell me your name. No, not like that. She bang, she bang. Uh, okay, let's let's unpack this not only does this song suck But the fact that a big group of guys are singing she bangs as they slowly approach a woman to presumably sexually harass her is just gross and disgusting and insane to me that that even made it past the first draft of this musical. Maybe this is the first draft. That would explain a lot. Anyway, that just really rubs me the wrong way, and it's pretty nasty. The biggest folly of Spider-Man Rocks is the song selection. This musical is less than 20 minutes long, and not only did they choose the most baffling songs to fill that runtime, but there are 12 of them. I'd literally rather have one original song rather than 12 shitty covers. <laughs> I love how Spider-Man's suit is hardly skin tight. It looks like a Halloween costume. Spider-Man beats the crap out of those guys who were perving on MJ, and MJ sings My Hero by Foo Fighters. <laughs> I like to think that they just had a big document of pop songs and they just sort of control f keywords they wanted to shoehorn into their musical because I can't think of any other reason that My Hero by Foo Fighters would be here other than that. Especially when you look at what Dave Grohl has to say about the meaning of the song. By the way, I mean, this is no secret. The song Hero is about Kurt Cobain, right. for, I, I, loosely based on Kurt Cobain, right? No? Nah. It's kind of more about just heroes that are ordinary. It's like ordinary every day. Wouldn't that make it working class hero kind of crap? Yeah, but are heroes ordinary or, in other words, are you saying that they all disappoint you? No, not at all. I'm it's just saying, that they're regular people. I look up to regular people more than I look up to celebrities. Right. Right. Absolutely. It's just so funny to me how much nuance they take away from the song by making it about Spider Man, a literal superhero. <laughs> Oh, that was just in the neighborhood. Oh, goodness, thank you so much. Anytime. Oh, the transitions between songs are so random. I love them. I'm on a hero. I also love how they decided to do a time jump by projecting spinning newspapers onto the set. It's one of the more comic booky parts of the musical. AM to PM by Christina Milan, Start the Commotion by The Wise Guys, and Let's Get Loud by Jennifer Lopez are next. And they're all unfortunately just filler numbers, sung and danced by the ensemble of random characters. And I mean, like, come on, really? Filler in a show this short? This is probably when every kid in the audience started asking, where the hell is Spider-Man? This show is called Spider-Man Rocks, and so far, he has done no such thing. All right. The unreciprocated energy of these performers just breaks my heart. It's not their fault that no one wants to get loud and or start the commotion. It's the show's fault for having three songs in a row with no Spider-Man. <laughs> That shit shouldn't slide. Where is my boy? <laughs> Next thing you know, Green Goblin bursts in on that little hoverboard thing he's got. Green Goblin in the hole! This directly segues into the most aggressively musical theater rendition of Another One Bites the Dust that one could ever hope for. I've got you now, insect. 
Which is kind of grim to sing, you know, as Green Goblin is actively bombing and murdering people. It's incredible. <laughs> Now I have a few thoughts about fight sequences in live theater, and it's that they hardly ever work, especially for a prolonged fight. You can't hide anything with cuts like you can in film, and overall, they're just really hard to make realistic. This is not helped by the use of the same punch sound effect multiple times in Spider-Man Rocks. That's the stock punch sound effect. Anyway, MJ comes in and seduces the Green Goblin. Which transitions into the weirdest song choice, maybe of the whole musical, Lady Marmalade. What does this achieve for us as a species? Not world peace, I'll tell you that much. Also in this song, she walks through the audience and they are not having it in this recording. <laughs> I do like how the action of the play moves into the audience for the climax of the show, and by like it, I mean it sucks ass. I just feel bad for the people in the orchestra seats having to crane their neck around behind them to see how this page-turning, seat-edging tale will end. The stakes are so high. If Spider-Man doesn't defeat the Green Goblin, um, well, they might start singing Another One Bites the Dust again. Look who's here! I thought you might be in the neighborhood. I love that they give the Green Goblin his own villainous monologue at the end of the show. It's incredibly basic, but there's something so funny about a guy in a Halloween costume dangling above a giant crowd of people screaming death to Spider-Man. You won't quit! So, now that you're here, let's cut to the chase! Death, Spider-Man! Death to you all! I will say, it was probably so cool as a kid to see Spider-Man swinging so close to you, however unsafe it must have been. And who cares, when you're a kid that kind of stuff is so cool, OSHA ain't shit. The two battle over war by the Temptations, which particularly makes no sense, you know, an anti-war song over... war. <laughs> Anyway, Green Goblin explodes and dies. And Spider-Man awkwardly brings MJ down to the streets of Queens, where the show began. <laughs> For the first time, MJ and Spider-Man have a moment alone. Who are you anyway? You know who I am. Peter Parker, I love you. Wait, how did she know that? He's barely said anything the entire show. He didn't even do the funny Spider-Man banter. Baby, I'm Spider-Man. And as Spider-Man goes off to save yet another day, the cast sings. It's the Spider-Man theme, easily the best song in the show. The first that makes sense. Spider-Man swings around for a bit and the audience goes wild. <laughs> That Spider-Man rocks. Wait, hold on. Sorry, that Spider-Man rocks. Now that we've watched the whole thing, you may be asking yourself, what was the story of Spider-Man rocks? And I respond to that question with a simple answer. 
I'm not quite sure either. Spider-Man doesn't need a story, I guess, according to Universal Studios. Just throw in a couple of tunes that everybody knows and let Spider-Man just dance around on a wire for a little bit. Who cares? And not so surprisingly, this worked, at least for little kids. Go to any video of this musical on YouTube and you'll be bombarded with comments of people talking about how much they loved this musical when they were children. That connection kids had with this musical was definitely the thread that kept this around at the park for nearly two years, along with Toby bringing back Spider-Man in a big way. Unfortunately, you know, as an adult, Spider-Man Rocks is rarely exciting, but it is frequently baffling. Not exactly the quality one might want in a Spider-Man joint, but hey, I had fun. Will I be watching this again? I mean, yeah, I have to edit this video still, but do I recommend that you watch it? Sure. Make a game out of it. Take a shot every time you physically cringe with your entire body. Maybe don't do that actually, drink responsibly. I do find this musical fascinating, however, in that everyone in the comments seems to hold such a deep nostalgia for it. Albeit that's the case with most musicals you watch bootlegs of on the internet, but it really does seem like this one has its fans. And honestly, that just always makes me happy. So if you're a fan of this musical, good on you. But am I? Not at all. Part two, Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark. You might be thinking, why isn't this last, you fool? Do you not crave retention on your videos? Trust me, I do. But I feel that out of all of the musicals that I'm talking about in this video, I have the least to say about Turn Off the Dark. Not only have plenty of YouTubers made videos about it, but I'm just tired of people calling this the biggest Broadway flop of all time. Yes, it's bad, and yes, it flopped, it lost so much money, but I feel like calling it that is an injustice to actual Broadway flops. I would much rather look at a show that's bad but ran for a long time, or a show that's really great but didn't even make it to Broadway. Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark, like, technically is a flop because no one liked it and it lost a lot of money, but it also ran for over two years. It had over a thousand shows. Merrily We Roll Along had 60 days. In short, I don't want to give Turn Off the Dark more power than it deserves. Turn Off the Dark was supposedly the biggest and most technically advanced show of all time. Alas, this musical, unlike most, went straight to Broadway and had no tryouts due to the technological requirements of the theater. They literally built this show around the Foxwoods Theater on Broadway, so it had to go there. And the logic behind this was quite clear. Spider-Man is too big to fail, right? Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. The show opened in 2011 and famously flopped for a lot of reasons. And what are those reasons? Well, I would chop it up to the three S's of Turn Off the Dark's failure. The story, the songs, and the stunts. The story was incredibly weak and weird and went through a lot of changes throughout the show's run. And the stunts... Well, a lot of people got hurt. A body double of Spider-Man tragically fell, breaking several bones, and nearly died. Natalie Mendoza, who played the Greek god Arachne, was struck in the head by a piece of dangling equipment. The show was even given several safety violations from OSHA. No one died because of these stunts, contrary to many people's beliefs, but people did get very seriously injured. It's really hard to read about, and I imagine it was even worse to see. The production was handled so poorly that this thing was bound to come crashing down. Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark is a mess, and it's one of the most documented musical flops on the internet. So what new could I bring to the table? Well, you might have noticed that I didn't mention one of those three S's that I created, and that is the songs. So I wanted to talk about the musical score of Turn Off the Dark because I feel it's one of the lesser talked about aspects of the show. Still talked about to death, but I felt like giving my two cents on the topic. Also, it's super important to note, I don't want any Turn Off the Dark heads to get on my case about this. There are two versions of this show. I will be mostly talking about the second one. The first version would be cool to review, but I didn't feel like making this video longer than it already is, and there's also not any great bootlegs of it out there. There's one that I found, but it's weirdly stretched out and has pretty consistent audio problems. The biggest difference between the two versions is that the first version had an entirely different second act in which a villainous spider god named Arachne seduces Spider-Man through nightmare magic and has sex with him, and the second version doesn't have that. At least not as much. I just want to make that clear. There are two different versions. I'm reviewing the second one. Now let's actually get into it. U2 is a band best known for their seminal 1987 record, The Joshua Tree, housing hits such as With or Without You and I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For. But when it comes to modern discourse about the band, it mostly comes down to, aren't those the guys who put that shitty album on my iPhone? And yes, 
They are those guys, but it does feel a little dismissive to call them just that. They also have a massive discography and are one of the most influential bands of the 80s and 90s. Hate Bono all you want, but U2 does have some good stuff. So it was a big deal when they claimed that they were going to give old Andrew Lloyd Webber a run for his money by making their own rock musical. And by a big deal, I mean potentially awful. Don't get me wrong, I think that famous musicians can write musicals, and many have. Waitress, The Lion King, Promises, Promises, and Night to five are all examples of quite good and successful musicals written by famous artists. It's just that U2 does not write music that I particularly would want to see in a musical. I like their music just fine, but a whole show... I don't know, it's risky. Unfortunately, U2 proved me right. The songs in Turn Off the Dark are brutal. Not only do many of them sound like rejected U2 songs, but they simply just don't work in a theater setting. So many of them do very little to move the story forward or to really develop the characters. You know, the two biggest functions of a Broadway show tune. You have the slow, lore-building myth of Arachne, which ultimately adds nothing to the show. <laughs> I get that at one point it did have some significance, but it just puts me to sleep. And it's the first number. And you have the goofy bullying by numbers, which, yeah, sets up that Peter is lame and gets bullied all the time, but it just kind of lets the first act dilly-dally story-wise. This thing moves at a snail's pace. Then Peter and MJ's duet, No More, kind of falls flat on its face, which is just what you get when you rip off the title of a Sondheim song. I like what they're doing here, trying to show the difference in each of these kids' upbringing and how they might be perfect for each other and all that, but the song itself is just not powerful or memorable enough to really achieve that. I'm taking hits from every side, every side of the too epic for its own good, and it also forgets to rhyme a lot, which just feels lazy. I mean, come on, Bono. And the songs are just so aggressively U2. I know I was singing their praises earlier, but with a lot of pop star musicals, while you can tell it's music by the artist, the show is seldom worse because of it. Like the SpongeBob musical. Each song adds to the story or the characters, follows many conventions of musical theater, yet it still sounds like the artists who wrote it. And each song is by a different artist. For example, I'm Not a Loser, the song written by They Might Be Giants, sounds like both a John Henry era They Might Be Giants song and a show tune. I'm not a loser. I don't secretly hate myself. In Turn Off the Dark, we just kind of get U2's newest record. <laughs> can't fault U2 for sounding like themselves, but it does sort of make you realize that maybe U2 wasn't the best choice for this project. Of course, there are some exceptions to this. For example, the song DIY World sounds like, mm, I don't know, if Danny Elfman shit his pants next to a synthesizer. The songs here are just all so corny, but not in a way that really aligns with Spider-Man, mostly in a way that's just bad. Really, you will rise There's also a leitmotif throughout the show that serves as Spider-Man's theme. It's an epic guitar lick that I think sort of fails in terms of demonstrating the mix between Spider-Man and Peter Parker. <laughs> It's a little too rocky with not much more to me, and compared to other themes for Spider-Man, it pales in comparison. Towards the end of Act 1, we get our first solo from Peter where we start to understand how he's feeling inside, uh, but it's mostly about how Uncle Ben died and he's sad. <laughs> Surprisingly, this show lacks a real I want song, which is just mind-boggling to me. It kind of feels like you 2 has just never seen a musical before, because lacking such a simple and meaningful tool in your show, especially when there's no clear reason for it, makes the show 
so much weaker. Like, it's not as if Peter has no wants. He wants to be cool. He wants to be with Mary Jane. He wants to be more than just some kid. His changing into Spider-Man means nothing to us because when it happens, we don't really know him yet. <laughs> All we really know about Peter is that he loves spiders and he doesn't like living with his Uncle Ben and Aunt May. The only song that I kind of get a kick out of is the Act 1 finale, Picture This. It's good for three incredibly basic reasons. One, it moves the story forward. Two, it's catchy. And three, it's about relationships. And that's it. That was the bar, Bono, and you hit it. Only one time, but good job, buddy. You killed it. So much of Act 2 is more of the same, just repetitive, meaningless songs. There's only two that I think are worth mentioning. The first is A Freak Like Me Needs Company, which is sung by The Sinister Six and The Green Goblin. I mention this one because it's just shocking that this was allowed on Broadway. Yeah, oh my DIY projects rolling now. It's just, it's just bizarre. The other one I want to mention is The Boy Falls From The Sky because my theory is that this song is literally just a repurposed U2 song. I saw you and me The drums, the lyrics, the repetition, this song just screams Bono. So yeah, the music is bad. Not very good at all. I could have just said that, it would have saved us a lot of time. In short, Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark is a bad musical, and not only is it bad, it feels like someone who has never watched a musical was tasked with making a musical. It lacks so many important conventions of theater. And I want song, an ensemble piece that sets up the location, a villain song that helps us understand the villain's motives. Yes, they are done in every musical, but they're done in every musical for a reason, Bono. These are not just standards for musical theater, but for general storytelling too, and they would have helped this musical a lot. There's a lot more here to uncover, such as the two versions of the musical and the changes between them, the fandom that has emerged from this show, the insane history of its creative team and producers, and even the actors. Hadestown's Reeve Carney originated Peter Parker, and Katrina Lank, most famous for the Creature from the Black Lagoon musical, was a replacement for Arachne. But others have done it better than me. If you're interested in the topic and want to learn more about the history of this musical, I recommend Wade in the Wings video about it. I've linked it in the doobly-doo. Oh, and if you're going to comment that the first version is better and that I should have reviewed that one and that it's a big injustice, I promise you that's not the case. I don't like that version either. Part 3. Spider-Man Man rock reflections of a superhero. Now, with the two aforementioned Spider-Man musicals out of the way, you might be asking yourself, what is left? What other themes of Spider-Man are we yet to uncover? Well, have you ever thought, what does Spider-Man feel on the inside? now that he has seemingly abandoned the life he once knew before? Is he filled with dread and ennui as he swings from skyscraper to skyscraper? Does he yearn for normality in his spider world? The answer is a resounding yes. The album is Spider-Man Rock Reflections of a Superhero, and it's one of the most bizarre albums I've ever heard. It's a 43 minute long journey that takes you through varying genres, multiple stirring narrations, and ultimately, Spider-Man's trials, tribulations, and woes. Now you may be screaming at your computer, Max, this is not a musical, you buffoon. But alas, you are wrong. You see, this is just a concept record now, dear viewer, but as we all know, Concept records are just musicals waiting to happen. Hadestown, Evita, American Idiot, Tommy, Chess, Spider-Man Rock Reflections of a Superhero. So accuse me all you want, but once you hear this thing and listen to what it sounds like, you'll agree with me. This thing rules. Created in a slew of Spider-Man memorabilia being all the craze by a budding new record label, this thing has fallen through the cracks of history a bit. It was written by a myriad of different artists all employed by Lifesong Records, including Mike Ragonia, Ray DeRue, Marty Nelson, and Terrence P. Minogue. Do any of those names mean anything to you? Probably not, but they mean everything to me 
These guys are my heroes. This project was even given the go-ahead by Stan Lee, and it includes narration by the man himself. So allow me to put on a flannel, shave my head, and give damn a seven, because today, for the first time ever on this channel, I am going to review an album. Which means I can't cut away to clips, so I gotta be really good at talking. Rock Reflections starts strong with High Wire, an upbeat and raucous track that shows you who Spidey is on the outside. I'm a high wire. Right away, we're not afraid to be on the nose here. This is a great song in my opinion, and it paints Peter in a really interesting light. Here he is a cocky, rambunctious hero who cares mostly about himself, but soon we will start to hear. What is Spider-Man really thinking? You're on tenter hooks, I can already tell. After High Wire, we hear our first of many narration segments. Effortlessly, he glides between the tallest buildings in mammoth New York City, but has he really kissed his old way of life goodbye? Wait, is that Stan Lee? He, he's talking so normal. <laughs> it's really nice to hear his voice on this thing, as weird as it is. Not only does it add to the authenticity of this project, but it adds a certain flair that I feel like you wouldn't get on your average Spider-Man rock opera. I mean, that's Stan Lee. Uh, that said, the narrations are rarely necessary, and they sort of restrict the flow of the record. Surely his bizarre and unique position of dual identity brings on its own unexpected traumas. What is Spider-Man really thinking? And here's where the album goes from mildly interesting to fascinating. I expected the next song to be a rock ballad, something to keep the tone of the previous song and to establish the genre of the record. But that's where I was dead wrong, because the next song is actually a sad psychedelic folk rock song with jangly reversed guitars and all. Peter stays and Spider-Man goes entirely changed my perspective of what this record could be. I've come to understand a very Andrew Lloyd Webber centric idea of what rock operas ought to be, but maybe I need to reassess the art form. What is this? I'll be honest, despite this song having the goofiest rhyme scheme, being far too edgy for its own good, and sounding like if Nick Drake had a kid who was really into comic books, I really love this song. The reversed guitars and syncopated strings add so much to the melancholy vibe, and it's the only song in this video that I go back and listen to regularly. <laughs> Now you don't even know what to expect from the next song, do you? Well, the story sort of goes back a bit in time after Peter stays, and we are presented with a song about Peter before he was Spider-Man, which means that Spider-Man Rock Reflections of a Superhero is technically an origin story. We're three for three. I will say there's something refreshing about not having to see this origin story, and it goes by rather quickly. Like in the next song, he's just gonna be Spider-Man already. Spoilers. But before that, he is just a square boy, which happens to be the title of the next song. Square boy, you gotta get cool, get cool. Square boy, you gotta get cool. Square boy, you gotta get... Square boy is a jazzy show tune about how uncool and lame Peter Parker is. This song is awesome. Not only is it a bop, but I can't get over how unhinged it is to write an entire song about how everyone just hates Peter Parker. <laughs> had some problems with the girls. He didn't quite know how to strike up a conversation. No, we couldn't communicate with the feminine nation. Oh. This song also covers Peter's transformation into Spider-Man, which is handled with such grace. The spider went mad. He went and bit Peter's hand and said, Whoa, whoa, we you gotta dig this. I know it's probably supposed to be like a metaphorical line of dialogue, but I like to imagine that in a stage production of this musical, a single spotlight falls onto the spider as he sings that line. God, I want to direct a stage version of this show so badly. Oh, there's also a lovely horn section at the end of this song. <laughs> So 
Peter now has his powers, but you might be wondering where does the album go from here? Well, don't worry. I'm going to tell you. Be patient, silly. There's really no clear precedent for the genre of this album. Despite the title being Rock Reflections of a Superhero, we've gotten one rock and one reflection, and they were different songs. So where do we go from here? Well, we get two sort of dad rock songs about Spider-Man discovering his powers. I'm finally free, yeah, I can fly. City lights are shining bright, I feel so high. Oh, what is this change? Within my being. Both of these tracks are pretty much about the same thing, and neither of them are standouts. One sounds like something a drunk dad might listen to on the Jimmy Buffett station, and the other one sounds like if ELO just sort of gave up. I don't hate them, they're just obvious fillers, and not something that I would listen to out of the context of the record. I sort of get the impression that multiple people wrote multiple songs for this album about the same thing, and rather than cutting one of them, they just sort of kept them both to fill out the album. This isn't the only time this happens. Through a narration by Stan Lee, we find out some tragic news for Peter. He's confronted by the worst of all possible shocks. Uncle Ben has been murdered. And then we get another show tune about how everyone at school thinks Peter should go to hell and die. This track list is crazy. Why would you put a song called No One's Got a Crush on Peter right after he finds out that his uncle died? It's just cruel. You're too clean for your own good. If they only understood, but they don't. Also, I love when this one girl sings so earnestly. No one's got a crush on Peter. No one's got a crush on it's amazing, and it blows bullying by numbers out of the water. Like she's taking her bullying so seriously, I love it. Anyway, the next song is about Gwen Stacy and is called Gwendolyn, and I'm sorry to keep playing this game with you, but can you guess what genre this song is? If you guessed country, you're wrong. It's actually a doo-wop song. When Jesus Christ, this album is awesome. Doo-wop love songs have always been so funny to me because imagine being so in love with a girl that all you can do is sing in your highest little falsetto voice. And it always works, I gotta try that. Anyway, Gwendolyn is followed by yet another love song for Gwen called Count On Me. It's not particularly necessary, but it's actually a jam. It's a very late 60s approach to pop. And every side has another. I'm sorry, but two love songs in a 40 minute long musical is a lot, especially when neither of them are duets. Come on, like just do a Don't Go Break In My Heart ripoff, is that too much to ask? In my head canon, this song is sung by Gwen Stacy just to give her some representation. All of the lyrics make sense that way too. The biggest problem with a lot of this musical actually is that a lot of the songs are technically sung by Spider-Man. Definitely needs more ensemble pieces and songs sung by other characters just to fill in the gaps. This can all be revised as we move off Broadway though. Just email me and I'd be happy to give more thorough notes. Next is a dream sequence with the song Dr. Octopus. Oh, it's been such a long, long time. Yes, it's been such a long, long time. It's a villain song, but it doesn't really work because the entire thing is inconsequential given that it's a dream sequence that we know is a dream sequence. It's also kind of a Beatles ripoff, but I don't really want to say that, so, so just listen. The chorus is very similar to the outro of Hello Goodbye. <laughs> So this thing is almost over, and you might be thinking that there isn't really a story here. Uh, and I would agree with you. There really isn't an overarching story, but there is an overarching theme. Remember, Spider-Man is sad. And the final two tracks really display that, both taking place after the death of Gwen Stacy. The first of these final two songs is, um, a hard listen. My dreams are yours to keep. 
I fall behind this mask of insufficient tears. It's horribly sappy and twee, but in the most medieval meaning of that word. This is the worst song here, a big swing and a miss, but I will be honest, it's very funny. But it left me wanting a ballad, which is something we've been missing this entire album. Luckily, the final track is just that, entitled Time Will Show Me The Way. Is it a perfect ballad? Yes. I've gotta stop, take a hold of my life. There's no more room for second guessing. I must think of tomorrow. It genuinely has everything you'd want in a ballad. Self-reflection, woe, a catchy walk down chord progression. I've made mistakes I can't undo. I can't replace the life I knew. It just leaves you lying on your bedroom floor, thinking about your life with a weird headache. The most human experience. And that's it. That's the end of Spider-Man Rock Reflections of a Superhero. This is one of my favorite things that I've ever found on this channel. It truly has everything. A bizarre and unbelievable premise, catchy songs, over-the-top show-stopping performances, a Stan Lee narration. And on top of that, it's got heart, which you really can't say about any of the other musicals I've talked about in this video. You can really tell that the people who made this thing cared about making something that was not only true to the character, but to themselves. When Marty Nelson sings Gwendolyn or Peter stays in the Spider-Man Goes, you can feel every single waking emotion in his performance. This is an incredibly weird record, but that doesn't mean that the people who made it didn't care. Arguably, they cared more than anyone else who has taken a stab at writing a Spider-Man musical. And that, to me at least, makes this a lovely piece of art. So that's it. Those are the three official Spider-Man musicals as of the creation of this video. And I think the question on everybody's mind is, what's next for old Webhead? Hopefully, not a musical. Yeah, I think Spider-Man is a good character in films and comic books, maybe the occasional video game here and there, but not for Broadway. That isn't to say he isn't a great character, I just think he might not be suited for the stage. It's hard to convey action in a compelling way on stage, and these musicals really seem to struggle to show the interesting parts of Peter as a character. All in all, I think we learned something today. If someone were to make another musical about Spider-Man, they should just take the music from Spider-Man Rock Reflections of a Superhero and write a script around that. Stop digging! You've struck gold! Hi, thank you so much for watching that video. I really appreciate you. I have some announcements to make. First, I am launching a Patreon. I'm very excited about this. I'm going to be uploading monthly exclusive videos there and occasional podcast episodes. Hi, it's Low Quality Max here. I'm here to tell you that the video is up. It's exclusive and it's about illegal Beauty and the Beast made by the same people who made Illegal Hamilton. So if you're interested in that, it's an hour and a half long and it's up there now and you should go watch it now. Okay, bye. I have a big enough ego to have a podcast, but not a big enough ego to post it publicly. So if you're interested in hearing my opinion, on random musicals. That's what I'm gonna make the podcast about. The first episode is up there right now with my friend Jack about Newsies. I know I've talked about Newsies plenty on this channel, uh, but it turns out I had more to say. So if you want to hear me talk more about that and maybe give some suggestions of other things you'd like to hear me talk about with my friend Jack or other friends, uh, go on to the Patreon and watch it. There's more info on the Patreon about the tier levels and the prices and exactly what kind of content you're in for. But if you feel like supporting the channel and you want exclusive videos, and maybe your name at the end of my videos from now on, go ahead and check that out. That's what I've been up to, though, just trying to cook up some heat before the holiday time. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, comment down below if you like this video. Like this video and subscribe if you would like to. That would be lovely. And uh, thank you again for watching. Okay, goodbye. Subscribe to my Patreon. A Goodbye, TV Patreon. You see that Patreon. I see and the party will be come as you are. We will all burn together when we burn. There'll be no need to stand and wait your turn. 
when it's time for the fallout and St. Peter calls us all out. We'll just drop our agendas and adjourn. <laughs>